and welcome back to Talks with Todd the Lender. For those of you turning in for the first time, Todd is my local lender here in the Central Valley of California. He works with Zero Mortgage and has almost two decades of experience in lending. So we decided that since there's so much information circulating about the housing market during COVID-19, we would start our own series with weekly episodes to update everyone tuning in with truthful firsthand information. So we're here for you and happy to answer all of your questions. Here we go with episode four of Talks with Todd the Lender. So Todd, it's so great to have you back again. How are you and your family holding up? You know, we're, we're, we're muddling through this like the rest of the world, I guess. It's, yeah, you guys uh, just spending a lot of time together in the house? Every day is a new challenge with spending lots of time with each other, but you know, we're making the best out of it that we can. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. I know that it's a challenge, but I think it's also a little blessing in disguise that we all get to spend time with our family. And I think it's really forcing us to appreciate each other. So that's Yeah, I really I really think that a lot of us kind of lost sight of what it meant to really slow down. And now that we're forced to slow down a little bit, I think it's given everybody a little bit different perspective on what we might have been missing out on. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think I'm trying to stay on the positive side of everything and, and see the light and everything. So I agree. I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page with that. So Todd, for today's talk, I actually want to focus on the fundamentals of mortgage lending. So I want you to share some basic knowledge and understanding. I have a few questions I'm asked like clockwork from my first time home buyers. I'm grateful that I have you. Um, you've provided answers to me enough times. I'm confident when giving initial responses, but I ultimately pass them off to you, the expert for further explanation. So it's important to me that we're a united voice and mind when speaking to our clients, and I truly appreciate all the information and education you've given me, so I definitely wanted to also share that here on this particular episode. So for my first question, what are the initial variables of information taken into consideration when you're calculating an approval for someone for a mortgage? And also, if you could explain, what are some immediate disqualifiers? The basics that we're looking for, um, which obviously the first thing that they're going to do is fill out an application. Um, in the COVID-19 world, everything is being done digitally. I have an, a, a website, toddfitton.com, that they can go to, fill out that application, and then I can get started on it pretty quickly. On that application, the things that we're looking for, name, address, social, birthday, um, those are the basics. Obviously, their employer, how much they make a month, um, bank balances, any other 401ks or anything that they want to include is, is uh, awesome. That helps us out. And then the, there's the general questions that we have to ask. If there's child support, alimony, foreclosures, all that good stuff. That's the basic application to get started just so that we can pull credit and then go from that point on. Um, obvious disqualifier would be credit. If your credit is not up to the minimum standards required by FHA, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac, then obviously we got to move to plan B, which is typically if, if I can see a way to get credit up quickly, we'll go that route. If it's something that's going to be a, a, a prolonged solution, I'll refer them over to one of the, the uh, entities that I work with to help with credit repair. That's honestly the quickest way to get around that. Um, job layoffs, recent credit pools um, for an auto loan could possibly disqualify them, but that's a whole nother ball game because now you're looking at debt ratios and, and uh, I like to get a little bit more information before I automatically disqualify somebody for that. Credit's really the main one. Um, and then obviously if you don't have a job, it's pretty impossible to buy a house. Right. And then you were saying just now that if you foresee a way for them to maybe pay off some of the debt that you can calculate uh, an approval. So there's like almost a simulation that you have in a computer system. You can do that. Correct. There's a simulation that we use through our credit company that we work with. And it, it's really a simple. It's like a what if calculator. I plug in a scenario and it'll tell me immediately what that credit score would jump to. It's just an algorithm that's used by the credit agencies that they allow the credit companies that we work with to utilize as well. And it also give me an accuracy on that. Recently did one that they only needed four points. Um, he had a credit card that was fairly maxed out. We went ahead, pulled that what if simulator and with a 97% confidence rating, it got us to a 660 immediately if he did what was required of him. Um, we're in the process of doing that one right now. 
so those small points, um, you know, the first time home buyer programs, they're running at a minimum 660 credit score right now. So if I've got somebody that's in the 650s and I see they've got a credit card maxed out, normally they can pay a little bit on that credit card and get that credit score up where it needs to be fairly quickly. It can also tell me on a time uh, table also. So if I can't get them to that 660 immediately, but that's all the money that they have to work with, I can also plug that out one, two, three, six, 12 months and tell them, you know, based on if you did this and waited a certain amount of time, um, it'll hit that score with this confidence rating. So we aren't experts at credit. That's not our job. That's not what we do, but it is something that we have these tools to try and help, you know, on a, on a more immediate level than going through a credit repair company. Okay, well, that's perfect. That really helps. So there's really a few avenues of how you can help someone get to that point. And like you said, if need be, and it's kind of a longer term game to get them to that score they needed, then there's affiliates that you have that they can go for credit repair. Absolutely. And that's, that's always the first route that I'll go if, if that's something that we need to look at. Just first time homebuyers, especially, um, they're always very appreciative. If they're a couple of points away, and it's going to cost them a couple of hundred dollars to get there we can normally work that out and, and make that happen for them. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for touching on that. Um, so speaking of credit scores, what about how applying for a mortgage affects one credit score? Is it considered a hard inquiry? How many points are deducted? And what's the difference between applying for a mortgage um, and then any other lines of credit, like you mentioned earlier, like applying for a vehicle? So a, a hard inquiry is any inquiry that's gonna show up on your credit report and applying for mortgage credit is absolutely gonna show up on your credit report. The difference is, is many years ago, back when the, we had the mortgage crisis in 2007 to 2010, they actually changed the guidelines to where the hit for the credit pool when you're shopping for a mortgage is substantially less than it used to be. So I, I can't speak to an exact number because every situation is different. And again, I'm not the credit you know, professional that's that's not my forte, but my experience has shown that those individuals shopping for a home loan, I've had people that have, have shopped elsewhere and then told me that their credit scores were anywhere from two to five points difference. Um, and it normally is only lasting 30 to 45 days and then the credit goes back to where it was. And the reason they do this is there's an initial hit, but they really wanna encourage buyers to shop. If you're not comfortable with what you're getting, they don't want you to feel like you're going to get penalized by shopping with another lender. That's what was happening back in the early 2000s. And people were getting handcuffed to the lender and those lenders were just robbing them blind because they could use that credit pool as a defense mechanism and say, Hey, you know, forget about what you think. If you go over here, it's going to hit your credit 30 points or 15 points or whatever it might've been. And now you won't even qualify. So they've taken that out of the equation as much as they can. You know, obviously if a 660 credit score is what they need and they're at a 661, well, now you gotta really think about it. But then again, those first time home buyer programs, they're the same no matter where you go. So you don't really need to shop that program per se. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then, um, so, as far as the difference, I know you've had, uh, we've touched on this before in a couple different episodes, but I wanted you to talk about the benefits of local lending versus big bank lending. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are just, they're more comfortable working with their bank, whether it's through the history that they have with them and that relationship that's been built with the tellers, um, you know, whatever that issue is, normally it ends up being the relationship they're more comfortable with their bank and they feel that a big entity like, you know, the, the big banks, there's more security there. That actually could not be further from the truth. The big banks have no vested interest in, in the immediate uh, marketplace. So for example, I'm in Tulare and yeah, the tellers and, and some of the other individuals that work there, they may have a vested interest in their marketplace, but the company as a whole doesn't. So they don't, care what happens to the clientele in that local market. Whereas for me and, and Barrow Mortgage especially, we're in Visalia, Tulare, Tulare County area, and we are 100% invested here. So the customer service level is always gonna be different. You know, the, our processing staff, our entire operations staff, it's all local. 
So you don't have somebody who might be in, you know, if you're in Tulare trying to get a home loan, the processor might be in Texas and the underwriters may be in Ohio or whatever the situation might be. And they don't really have any, any, you know, draw to that community. And they, they, the care is different. I don't care what anybody says. It always is. It's, it's different when you have to look that client in the eye and they can come to your office and, and they can deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's always going to demand a different customer service level. So nothing against the big banks. They're all good at what they do and the way that they do it. But when it comes to just the everyday deal, no matter what it is, you're always going to get a better customer service level from the local company. And that in turn is going to make it to where the agents prefer to work with the local entity, which is then as a buyer is going to make your offer a lot easier and a lot better to look at from a seller's perspective if it's got a local lender attached to it. You know, you get a big bank on there and they're like, well, you know, if it's one of the big three, which are Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and they're like, well, I don't really know that I'm going to be able to get a hold of anybody if I need to get your pre-approval letter, if I need to get a question answered. Whereas if it's somebody at one of the local companies, they know they can pick up that phone and or go to their office and find them. So it, it's, it is definitely customer service is key. And really when it comes down to rate, I'm not really seeing any of the big companies that are able to beat us because they really aren't wanting to do the volume that they used to do to cover that cost difference. So that's the big difference as of right now. Great. Thank you so much for touching on all those points. I definitely have my own little script that I use for my buyers that I've learned from you on touching all the points of the benefits. And I certainly lean heavily on customer service. I know you've experienced with my clients, sometimes they text you at eight or nine at night with a question and most of the time you respond right away. So I think that's a really big part of it. Buying a home is a huge investment. It's a huge purchase, especially for first time home buyers. It can be really nerve wracking and having someone that they know they can go to to, like you're saying and and ask even if it's later at night or a Sunday most of the time they're gonna get a response and so I certainly appreciate appreciate your customer service and taking care of my clients and thank you for touching on all of the benefits of the local lending versus big banking because there's just so many there's so many benefits yeah and I, at any time a buyer does come to me and they have those questions I try to be as transparent and honest as possible and I mean I don't know how many times I've told people that you know what hey if this is your fifth or sixth house buying and you know for whatever reason i might be getting beat by that credit union then by all means you can go with that credit union the same theory is still going to apply that the seller may not want your offer because they're not local and typically if it's six o'clock at night and they're wanting that pre-approval i can normally just make the point of customer service by saying go ahead and call your lender over there and get that pre-approval and get it over to your agent and the response is always well they're closed right and then my response is then you've got me on the phone right now yeah. So there, there's, there is definitely that very common sense, obvious customer service level that your local lender, like you said, you can get them on the phone pretty much any time of day. If you're working with a credit union or a bank, it's nine to five and it is what it is. Yeah, definitely. No, thank you so much. I appreciate you highlighting all those points. So um, if you do have an applicant that's been pre-qualified, they get the loan estimate from you in the beginning to show them what their estimated monthly mortgage payments will look like and a breakdown of everything. How much difference is there in those initial numbers to the final estimate received towards the close of escrow, assuming nothing has changed in the purchase price, of course? Yeah, as far as payment goes, the only thing that's going to change from the time you start until the time you close is if the interest rates changed between the time that it was the loan estimate was disclosed to the time it was locked. That is obviously going to cause a payment change. And then in a lot of cases, when we're putting our files together, the hazard insurance is an estimate. We typically estimate high, so the payment should drop a few dollars because once we get the actual hazard insurance, the, the number will be a little bit lower. So on payment, that's all that's gonna change that. Now closing costs, um, barring no mistakes by anybody on, on the front end of the file, um, as long as escrow got all their fees correct and, and uh, you know the third parties that we deal with didn't make any substantial changes, um, there really shouldn't be a whole lot of change from that point on. Um, there is a closing disclosure that must go out at the end of a file. And a closing disclosure and a loan estimate look very, very similar. And in our case, with our system, if there's a variance in, in the Section B items, which is third-party items that can be shopped for, if there's a 10% variance on those items, anything over that 
it red flags our system. On the other sections, there's a zero tolerance. So any change on those, it's red flagged. And once it's red flagged, our system actually will not even allow us to send out that closing closure. So on our end, we have to remedy that before we can even send the closing disclosure to the customer. So there's a lot of, of you know, fail safes involved to make sure that those numbers come out as close as possible. Um, I've only, to be honest, had one that was way off and that was because the file started with a seller credit and ended without a seller credit and that seller credit did not get pulled out prior to the previous loan estimate. So once that adjustment was made, obviously there was a substantial difference in those closing costs and uh, we were able to work that out and make it to where the system would release that closing disclosure. So it, other than that, there really shouldn't be much of a variance. And most of the time the numbers come in a little bit less than what was initially disclosed. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. And then you did mention this in the beginning of your answer, which is locking the rate. So can you go over kind of the time frame of locking the rate and how it is that you work hard to protect the lowest rate that you can? Absolutely. There's, there's going to be different levels of loan officers in this business or loan originators, whatever you want to call us. And really when you start looking at the individuals that have been in the business for you know several years, and when I'm saying several, I mean anywhere from five to 25 to 35 years, um, like myself, I'm 17 years in the business. We've learned to read the market. Uh, most of us work with some company that's also giving us information daily or, or many times throughout the day so that we can track the markets and track what the interest rates are doing. And this allows us to be on the cutting edge, make sure our customers are getting the best rate possible so that we're not locking too early or locking too late. The best that's the best thing that we can do for our clients is invest in that, invest in ourselves to help them. Now, if it's a first time home buyer program, we have limited lock periods on those. So a lot of times we are not able to lock those loans until we have an approval. Um, also, if the lock is canceled for any reason, there's a fee to the company and, and we can't obviously absorb the fee on every single file. So we try to be as safe on those as possible. But again, doing it within making sense. If the market's making a change for the worse, and I know those for some home buyer programs are going to change, I'll go ahead and request a lock on those right then, and then we'll just have to move a little bit faster to make sure that everything goes according to plan. Um, once the loan is locked, a new less loan estimate will go out, and it will state that it's locked with all of the new terms. And then again, that loan estimate must match the closing disclosure at the end in order for us to get closing documents so that they can finish up the file. Okay, great. And at what point normally during the transaction is that rate locked and then a new loan estimate goes out or does it vary on every transaction? It's different on every transaction. There's some where I'll take an application right in the heat of a change in interest rate. And if I see a outlook on the rates being negative, I'll go ahead and lock the loan right then. Because and when I say that, I mean, okay, in the next two to four weeks, I don't know what's going to happen. And if anything, it's probably, you know, it's way, it's weighing more towards negative than it is positive. I'll go ahead and lock them right then. So that way, what I'm quoting is, is what I'm giving. I don't, I, it really pains me to ever have to give a customer bad news when it comes to their interest rate or their fees or anything like that. So I, I always try to err on the side of caution. Again, that's why I've invested in myself and learning about mortgage backed securities and bond yields and, and how that's affecting the interest rate so that I can be the best prepared as possible for those clients. Um, I've locked them all the way up until the last week. You know, if that's beneficial and all the professionals out there that, that manage these markets are telling us to, to what they call float, then I'll float that out and, and gain and gain and gain on that interest rate as much as possible. And I've, I've had loans where I, just did one a couple of months ago that I quoted them at a 3.875 and ended up locking them at three and a quarter. Um, and that was a legitimate change in rate over a two week period. So it's just one of those things that, again, depending on who you're working with, those of us that have been doing this long enough, we understand the markets and we can go ahead and, and uh, make those best decisions for the clients and then, uh, and, and lock them, any time throughout the process, you know, as long as we can meet our timelines. 
Perfect. Thank you. Well, once again, you've outdone yourself and, and thank you so much. I'm really grateful that we get to spend this time together virtually and just kind of go over everything, whether it's COVID-19 updates or basics about lending. I'm just so grateful that you're willing to spend this time with me so we can educate my clients, everyone out there, friends, family, whoever might be tuning in. So I really appreciate your time, Todd. Um, so I'm going to be sending this out, obviously, on all my social media platforms and make sure everyone is staying in the know with us and showing our clients that we're still here. We're ready to work for them, whatever they need. We're happy to be of service to them. So with that being said, do you have any final remarks for us, Todd? Just to stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you on the other side of COVID-19. Sounds good. Thank you, Todd. I'll chat with you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.